Welcome to Grace Mennonite Brethren Church service this morning. Um, we're happy uh, that all of you could make it. Uh, Pastor Harry will be on a working vacation for the next three weeks. And so we have the pleasure of having Sarah White with us um, to open God's word to us for the next three weeks. So welcome, Sarah. And we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this morning. 
Over the next three Sundays, the sermons will be based on the theme of being a community of the gospel. This morning's sermon will look at Jesus' baptism and what it means to us as members in the community of believers. As I was preparing my call to worship for this morning, there were actually two sources that spoke to me about the power of the water of baptism and the community that baptism creates. The first passage from Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 25 speaks to the cleansing power of water and the need to worship as a community so that we can continue to encourage each other. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And this is from the NIV translation. The other piece that stood out to me is the third stanza of the hymn, Baptized in Water. Baptized in water, sealed by the Spirit, marked with the sign of Christ our King, born of one Father, we are his children. Joyfully now God's praise we sing. Baptism makes us children of Christ, and what greater community could we belong to than Christ's family? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit today to be amongst us as we worship you and learn about you. We pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts so that we might hear your message today. This we pray in your son's name. Amen.
Good morning, and what a beautiful sunny morning it is. Pastor Harry is taking a break for the next couple of weeks, so this week I'm sharing with you the pastoral prayer time. Please remember to read the weekly newsletter for prayer updates and other news happening in our church community. If you have concerns that you need to talk about, call your friends and or the caring committee members listed on the last page of the newsletter. I would encourage everyone to call at least one person from the church each week because the days can seem long and laborious to some people. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. These are challenging days, but God is with us. This morning we were walking and one of the hymns that played while walking was Sweet Hour of Prayer. Let me read the words to the first verse. Sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and opportunity of worshiping together. It's not our preferred style of worship, but we would rather all be together in one room, unmasked, but this is still worshiping you. We thank you for being with each one of us this past week. Some of us have had unexpected experiences. Others have had the same thing day after day. Others have had moments of happiness and still others have had very sad and disappointing times. In spite of whatever we have experienced, thank you for being with us. We confess that sometimes we are weary and discouraged and wonder why we are living in such an unusual way. Forgive us when we neglect your nudging, your love and your direction. Thank you for the start of a new week and may each one of us this week be assured that you are with us and will direct each day. We pray for the Radiant City Congregation and that together we will continue to seek your guidance and direction as to whether we are to continue to get to know each other's congregants and how we are to work together if that is your will. We pray for the people in our community where our church building is located and many of them walk by the church and see the sign stating that there is help for them if needed. I pray that if there are people who need help, that you will speak to them and that they will call and the person responding will be directed by you to give the help needed. Thank you for the season of Lent and during this time, may each of us find time to focus on the fact, sacrifice that you made for each one of us. And in return, may each one of us find something that we can give back to you in some form. In your name we pray, amen.
This morning's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, and it's the baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be with you and to be here with you. And I am excited to talk to you because community is one of my favorite things to talk about. It's probably the key theme or the most consistent part of my narrative and calling with God. When Brian and I, my husband, when we look at our lives, when we look at our faith decisions, when we pay attention to how God has called us and the ways we have met Jesus and have been shaped by the Holy Spirit, it is largely through the lens and experience of community. And it would be easy this morning or to talk about all of the different ways that um, we need community, but we just want to start with a profound truth, which is that we are not meant to be Christians alone. The call to this life, to be followers of Jesus, has always been a call of community. It's about our personal relationship with Christ, yes, but it's not lived out in a personal vacuum, but in community, in the body of Christ, in the church. And so for the next three weeks, thank you for having me, and I look forward to journeying with you. We're going to talk about community. We're going to talk about how community works. We're going to talk about what makes it unique. Why is this community? Why is this gathering different than going um, to my gym or to a, I don't go to the gym, uh, going to a gym, going to another local social club, whatever it is. Why is this different? Why is church different? And why we bother? So what makes it different? And then what, what does it change? What does it do in the world around us? And so we're going to talk about how community is an expression and revelation of the gospel, that it is both the visible presence of God and the best way to tell the story of God's love. I have a very high value for community. And so what I wanted to let you know too is that some of what I'm sharing today and in the coming weeks, I have learned in community. I've studied these passages with friends, with um, different groups. I've shared a home, we've co-owned a cafe, Brian and I have opened ourselves up entirely to gospel community and have felt the beauty of it and also worked through a lot of the challenges of it. Of course, we're not perfect, 
Um, I certainly don't know it all, but I do know that we are made for community. So today, as we begin, we're going to look at how a gospel-centered community works. Now, I know that we can spend a lot of time thinking about what a community does or the role of community, but I want to pay first and foremost attention to the kind of community we are called to, not the function of the community, but how we are when we are as a community has less to do with the kind of community because it moves past those functions because it talks about the ways we act when we're together, regardless of the kind of gathering, whether it's Sunday or small groups or serving teams, friendships in our world, at our work, how we are speaks to a base level, a foundation that goes past sort of the, the pieces of what we do and when we do it and why that kind of stuff, but looks at what is true in all of these situations. What are, how are we when we're together? How does the way we act, the way we interact with each other, reveal the gospel? How does the way we are when we're together, how we interact, reveal the gospel? So we're going to do this. We're going to ask this question and look at this, how this community, how we are together, reveals the gospel. We're going to pay attention to a few key texts in scripture, Jesus' baptism, creation, and uh, prayer of Jesus. And we are just going to listen to the text. Thank you so much for reading it, Tessa. Um, it says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to fulfill this obligation, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I loved. With him I am well pleased. Okay, so we just want to look at this text, and it's going to help us see who Jesus is and who we are as Christians. See, the basic, one of the basic things we're dealing with here in this idea of community in theology is that of the Trinity of God being communal in nature. Now, we don't actually have the word Trinity in scripture, but Trinity is the word we use to describe the characteristics, the nature of God we experience. It is how we understand the relationship between the Godhead that we see, Father, Son, and Spirit, all God, co-equal, co-eternal. And so we're just gonna step out of this text for a minute and go back to creation because we actually see this right from the very beginning. Genesis 1 reads like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So when we look at that text, we could say, how are we seeing the community there, and yet we see the words that tell us who God is. In the beginning was God. This is the word Elohim. This is the word for God. And it actually, it's plural, which tells us there's an element of community here, that there is something in God himself that carries more than just a singular. And it says, now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of God, the Ruach, the Hebrew word there is Ruach, the spirit of God, was hovering over the waters. So we have God, we have the Father, we have Ruach, the Spirit, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke his word, his devar, his, that's the Hebrew word for word, and that, when we read the beginning of John, tells us in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and that word is Jesus. So right from the outset, we know that there is a community in God, that there is a lot happening here. There's a very rich and beautiful text. We have all three working together, cohesive, in the cre very creation of who we are and who God is. This is a functioning, relational, beautiful God. But Jesus, as he continues, calls us into this relationship. See, we can say that that is who God is. But then we need to remember that that is the, the image that we have been created in. And so when we go to John 17, 
So we know we have this baptism where these, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are present. And they have journeyed there from creation from the very beginning. And we can say that that is good for them. But then listen to how Jesus calls us into it. In John 17, starting at verse 20, he says, My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for all who will believe in me through their message, and that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus, in claiming his divinity and his oneness with the Father, invites us into relationship in a profound way. We don't do community because it's just a good idea. We live out our lives in community but it, because it reflects the image of God himself. We don't bear full witness to who God is if we are outside of community because we cannot bear full witness to our communal God, to this beautiful triune God that was there at creation, speaking the world into being, speaking us into being the word alive. We don't bear full witness to him if we are isolated and on our own. In creation, we see a relational God. In our creation, we see a relational God. This is so important. And there's a call to unity. Jesus pointing us to, his, to this specific role, that they will be one, that we will be one, as Jesus and the Father are one. So we want to ask ourselves this question, what does this oneness look like? And when we experience Jesus, this is the incredible part, and this is where we're going to pay attention. Jesus is going to come and show up. And so we're going to go to his baptism and look at what it tells us about community, because this is the one that we have in, um, in the flesh where we have a person there with us. And so we're going to pay attention to some of the qualities we see here. And it's pretty simple. It's two verses of scripture, and yet there is so much here. If we go back uh, to the baptism, to Matthew 3.16, uh, we read Matthew 4, 5, it's fine. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven was saying, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So we're just going to pause there. This is an incredible articulation of the Trinity. There is this moment where Jesus is being baptized to fulfill the law. And when it happens, heaven opens and the spirit of God shows up. And then a voice who we uh, attribute to the father because it says, this is my son whom I loved with him. I as well am well pleased speaks. See, the way if we look at how this Trinity interacts in just this moment, we will notice that they are supporting, that they are there for one another, that they are showing up and being present and speaking. And when they speak of one another, it is positive. This is my son. With him, I am well pleased. When Jesus speaks of the Father, it is positive. There is joy. There is the spirit of God alighting and heaven's opening. There is love. This is my son whom I love. There's a, a, a deep love being moved here where heaven has opened just to show up in this moment. They will move heaven to show up for one another. They are communicating. They are talking and being present with one another. It is public. People are watching. There was a crowd with John the Baptist. So it is public and open and it is celebrating. This is beautiful. See, this is the community of God that we are called to represent. 
the kind of community that can go to real places with others because we know the nature of the God we serve, a supporting, positive, pleasing, joy bringing, loving, communicating, present, public, celebrating community. How incredible of a witness that would be in our world. This is a loving, others-centered God. This is the God that we bear witness to, the one who we know in Jesus. And this is the way that we can bear full witness to him by loving him and loving others the way that he has modeled, not in the person of Jesus, but also in the Godhead as we get to experience it, in the Holy Spirit, in the Father who has loved us so much that he has sent Jesus to be with us. It is foundational to understanding the nature of God and that as his image bearer, that nature who he asks us to be. On top of all that, the Trinity illuminates what kind of community we should be and who we are to think about, to be a loving, other-centered community. When we think about the how of community, how we do this, this is how we're supposed to be in this kind of community that draws the attention of a watching world that isn't about being good or doing things right, but about things being real, about calling one another into important and meaningful relationships knowing that we are going to function out of this loving, caring place. And this is incredibly hard work for us because um, we aren't members of the Trinity. We aren't the, the divine. We don't have all of that. Uh, we are still human. And so we have to do work, but our hope is in them. Our hope is in God, is in the Father and the Son and the Spirit, in Jesus. We are image bearers. We are reflections of this beautiful triune God. But I want us to notice another thing because it can all seem really big and grand. And of course, that's how we would want to be, but we're people and it's hard. But let's pay attention to just a little bit more in the Matthew text. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized and do you come to me? And do you come to me? Right there, that moment. See, we pay attention to a lot of other things in this text, but I don't know if we've noticed how important this sentence is. And do you come to me? The Messiah, the one John knows is the fulfillment of who God is, the one God is going to send the one that is the fulfillment of everything God has been doing all of these years, the one John is heralding, is showing up in the flesh. This is the Messiah, the one who comes, the one who has made his home among us, who has set up his tent and moved into the neighborhood, the word of God. John's amazement, do you come to me, should be the very amazement of each of us who calls Jesus Lord. He is the God who comes to us. He is the Messiah. Being God and not, not considering equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He showed up. So we, too, show up. Just like those at the baptism and Jesus himself. He showed up. See, when we consider how we experience the Trinity, how to think about being and living out this kind of community, you don't need big fancy words or profound theological thoughts. We can get caught in all of that, but that's not what we need. You need to know how God has shown up, Father, Spirit, and Son, how he shows up in your life and changes the way you live. When you talk about your faith, about what you see God doing in the world around you, you are speaking about a God who shows up because he has shown up and he will do it again. Because he came down and died and rose so that nothing, not even the finality of death, had a say in the life of those who call him Lord. And do you come to me?
yes. And look at who I am, Jesus says in this moment. When John is saying, what, how am I even doing this? Jesus is thinking, just wait until you see who I am. This God, Father, Son, and Spirit revealed to the world. This is the fullness that you have hoped for. See, this is how we live out a life that reflects the Trinity, that reflects our God is supportive, positive, pleasing, joy-bringing, loving, communicating, present, public, open, celebrating. This is the community we give witness to. This is the God we serve, the one who shows up and has promised to keep showing up until all things are brought to their redemptive conclusion. So let's have conversations. How can we open ourselves up for relationship? How can we open ourselves up to learning? How can we be a loving, other-centered community in a way that makes people wonder what this can all be based on? What kind of God loves like this? It means that we have to get out of our echo chambers, everyone just agreeing with us, and lean on the community that we are a part of and the beauty of the Trinity as we do so to learn, to serve our loving other-centered God. We need to trust that we are going to function with these truths, that we are going to function out of our image of God, not out of our, our human trappings, but to pay attention to how he has asked us to interact when we move into these places of learning and challenging. Because community will do that. As soon as we start to interact and get to know others, it gets complicated. Where has God placed you to be a witness to the Trinity, to a Messiah who has brought life to this incredible, incredibly vibrant, hope-filled life and community? Where are you in your days? And I know that right now it is hard to figure out where we are. And yet I think these, this is why we want to ask these things of how we function when all of our settings are disrupted, all of our normal places no longer exist, all of our general interactions are a bit changed, even church itself. We want to ask ourselves, how can we live out this truth? Where have we been placed that we can live out this truth to love like the Trinity loves, to function in a community the way the, how the, the Trinity functions to to live out this presence, this showing up. I loved earlier um, when Ruth was suggesting everybody connect once a week. Let's get connecting and finding people because that is how we can live out this Trinity. We are made for community. We are made to be in relationship with one another. And it is hard right now, but we can live out this witness all the more beautifully showing up more, being supportive and positive, pleasing, joy bringing, communicating, public, celebrating, just being a community that insists on joy. That doesn't mean we insist on relentless positivity. It means that we are going to remember who God is and that he has shown up and will show up again. Let's go in the name of this triune God of Father, Son, and Spirit, loving, celebrating, open and joyful. Bring it on, world. Bring it on, COVID. We have Jesus. We can do this. So as we pay, we notice these things how we are. Next week, we're going to look at who we are and how we are unique, how these beautiful attributes lend themselves to a story of the gospel and to, uh, to telling the world and to creating spaces where we can be brought together that are entirely reliant on Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to people be your people. You, yeah, you are our God. You are so full of good news. You are so full of hope. May we feel your joy, even in the lengthiness of this season. May we recognize that our discomfort can be handed to you and that we can live in the truth of your hope because you are the God who comes to us. 
Would each person here recognize that you are the God who has come to them? You who are present at creation, bringing about light and life into this world, you are the same God who has shown up and you are the one whose work is not yet done. May we remember as we seek to live out this kind of community that it is based on you and on who you are and who you have called us to be. We pray in your name. Amen.